part of this symposium and the objectives that you all are, are reaching for. Uh, we are driven to consider, well, wait a minute, let me see if, uh, let me, momento. Uh, yeah, is the first slide up? Where's the slide? Can you see? It's a little dim. Okay. Now here's the situation. We are driven to consider renewable energy sources because we are in a crisis. We live in a world whose climate is changing radically, and that change has to be, at least in part, the result of burning so much fossil fuel. But this is far from the first time that energy consumption has led to a crisis. It has happened many times in the past. And I think it will help our conversation this morning if we look at how previous crises have been resolved. Example, it might be a surprise that steam engines first came into being because of a terrible energy crisis. I don't think that is widely recognized. Uh, it might also be a surprise that steam engines had been in use for some 60 years before James Watt made his famous engines. In a moment, we'll see how the steam engine first solved one energy crisis and then caused the next one. That's the sort of thing I want us to think about this morning. But I'll begin even before that. I'll go back more than 800 years uh, an energy crisis that arose in the late 13th century. By then, Europe had undergone a population explosion. The climate had warmed. Europe had created a whole new power technology. It was based first on water power and then on the windmill. And her forests had suffered. European millwrights had built tens of thousands of wooden water wheels, and then windmills needed even more wood. This furious rate of construction had gone on for around 300 years. These new power sources had led to prosperity and overpopulation, and that was coupled with the destruction of forests. The use of iron had also increased dramatically. It took a whole cubic meter of wood, first baked into charcoal, to smelt only two kilograms of iron. Iron smelting was another terrible consumer of wood. And speaking of iron, metal mining uh, needed wood superstructures and tunnel supports. 16th century drawings of mining operations show the surrounding forest destruction. Vast amounts of wood also went into forms that were used to build the great cathedrals that rose during this period. Trees were cut down to build houses and then to heat those homes and to cook food. As early as 1205, 12, uh, uh, 1205 uh, AD, an Italian settlement created its own reforestation plan. Each citizen had to plant 10 trees a year. That, of course, was a mere gesture. It was not a solution. 25 years later, the English had to begin importing Scandinavian timber. Of course, European wood construction created a 13th century energy crisis, and it called for radical measures. The British were the first to find a new way around the fading supply of wood. They found that they could replace much of their wood construction. What happened here? What happened here? Oh, going backward. There we are. Okay. Uh, 
they found that they could replace much of their wood consumption by burning surface coal. That was also called sea coal. Huge outcroppings of coal lay near the English coast around places like Newcastle. Uh, have you heard the English saying, uh, we have a saying, it's, if, if suppose you give a necktie as a gift to somebody and that person already has 50 neckties, you say that's like bringing coal to Newcastle uh, because uh, Newcastle was, was the place of coal and it's sort of stuck in the English language uh, uh, that way. Marco Polo made his famous journey to China a generation later and he was amazed when he found the Chinese using coal. Marco Polo didn't know that the English were already using coal for smithing, brewing, dyeing, smelting. They'd even begun exporting some of that coal to France. But Marco Polo was, was from Italy and Croatia. He was down south. He didn't know about all that. And so he came back talking about the Chinese discovery of coal. Uh, sea coal was filthy stuff. It was loaded with bitumen and sulfur. It created environmental problems from the start. A serious fight broke out over the use of coal between medieval environmentalists and medieval industrialists. But as the population grew, people were driven to use this foul fossil fuel anyway. Uh, I ran across an angry 14th century song with these words, swart smutted smith smattered with smoke, drive me to din with din of their dints, the crooked caitiffs crying after coal, coal, and blowing their bellows that all their brains burst at. <laughs> and, and the situation grew even worse and worse. Finally, nature intervened to solve the problem in a most terrible way. First, famine entered in overpopulated Europe. Uh, then between 1315 and 1317, terrible rains destroyed crops. Hunger and death were everywhere. Some people even reverted to cannibalism, eating their newly dead. It is an old story. Good times increase population until the world has little capacity to withstand bad times. Uh, but this time, famine was only the beginning. The real disaster was not famine. It was, and this is some, a theme I will come back to, the real result of all this was unexpected. Tartars attacked a group of European merchants in a town in the Crimea in 1347. But the Asian Tatars were sick. They were suffering from an epidemic they were too weak to press their siege of the, of the uh, Italian merchants. So they used their catapults, their trebuchets, to hurl their own dead over the walls, over the city walls. That was primitive germ warfare, and it proved all too successful. The merchants got away. They fled back to Genoa, carrying a disease called Yersinia pestis. Rats followed them off their ship carrying fleas. The fleas in turn carried the plague that we call the Black Death into Italy. Plague deaths were uneven, but they were generally terrible. Some cities, Siena and Zurich, for example, lost two-thirds of their people. Around 40 percent of Europe's population died in a few years' time. Countless villages vanished. Today, aerial reconnaissance makes it possible to see where medieval villages once were. Thousands of such ghost villages have been spotted from the air all over England and Europe. Europe recovered from the plague in the 15th century, and coal was still the common source of heat. The population pressure had temporarily been relieved relieved, and now new technologies of, of uh, metal mining were being used to get at deeper coal. Miners learned to follow seams uh, 
deep into the earth, into the relatively clean seams of hard coal that we mine today. But uh, that, that coal may have been plenteous, but around the seven, late 17th century, miners discovered something. They could follow their seams of coal only down to the water table. To mine further, they needed a way to drain water from the mine shafts below. So think about that problem. Mine drainage needed far more power than human laborers or oxen could provide. Miners needed power, uh, uh, needed power for pumps in regions where streams, they did not have streams to drive water wheels. And wind power was never consistent enough. Windmills couldn't be trusted to keep draining mines while people were down in them. Europe's dependence on coal was now huge, and the accessible supply was getting smaller. What they needed was an engine to power drainage pumps. Naturally, an engine that ran on coal would be a perfect solution, but the thermodynamic connection between heat and power was not yet understood. People didn't realize that heat was connected to power. Now it's so ingrained in us that, you know, we, we wonder how that could be. But that was the situation. Steam engines were not on anyone's mind. So people did what they still do today when they are in trouble. They fed on unreasonable hope. In this case, it was the hope of perfecting uh, a, a perpetual motion machine. That is, a machine that can produce usable power, usable energy, without consuming energy in some other form. We would not have a science of thermodynamics for another two centuries. And with no clear first and second laws of thermodynamics, it seemed possible that energy might be created out of thin air. And I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. Isn't that what windmills were doing? Windmills were plucking energy out of the thin air. Uh, shouldn't we be able to do that in other ways? As early as 1150, a Hindu mathematician named Bhaskara had proposed a machine that could produce continuous power. His idea was simple enough. A wheel had weights mounted on arms all around its rim. They swing radially outward on the right, and they hang downward on the left. And so that keeps the wheel forever out of balance, right? Shouldn't this over-centered wheel turn forever? It's obvious. It will clearly work, right? Right? OK, let's forget all the science. Let's just go and build over-centered wheels. Uh, back then, we didn't yet know how to keep track of the kinetic and potential energy involved in this rotation. Of course, many people doubted this odd wheel would do what it was supposed to do, but so far, they didn't have the science to prove that it was impossible. Besides, if you built a machine like this, it would often start turning when you released it, and of course, it would hang up as soon as the next arm poised to pass over the top uh, didn't have enough energy to flip over. But surely with just a little adjustment, we just make a little adjustment, we can make this work, right? right? I better understood why people kept on believing in perpetual motion after I had my own machine built. I showed it to smart people, and even when they knew perfectly well that perpetual motion was impossible, do you know what they did? They couldn't resist suggesting ways to me to make it work more efficiently. <laughs> it reminded me of the old story about an engineer condemned to die on a guillotine. Do you know that one? The guillotine malfunctioned, and the engineer couldn't resist saying to the captors, look, if you just reset that bolt up there, the blade will fall the way it's supposed to. My little perpetual motion machine was seductive in that same way. After India, Muslims took an interest in the over-centered wheel. It showed up in France in the 13th century. And ever since, inventors have re recommended building this ingenious device 
And every time they tried and failed, they thought they just got the proportions wrong. We finally had a principle of conservation of mechanical energy in the 18th century, so it was absolutely clear that the over-centered wheel could never be made to work. But since then, each new physical phenomenon has given birth to new perpetual motion machines. Today, we see perpetual motion machines based on static electricity, on surface tension, magnetism, hydro, uh, hydrostatic forces. Uh, what you see here, this is a, a siphon that uh, pumps water forever. Just try it. Uh, and in this case, I don't know if you see what's happening, but, but here is a reservoir A, and the reservoir through this pipe B is uh, turning a turbine, and the turbine in turn is pumping the water back up into the reservoir. And up here, you see a mill grinding grain, and these guys up here are counting the money. Okay? Uh, so anyway, I do a radio program about invention in the United States, and so I get a lot of mail from perpetual motion machine inventors. Every month or so, I have to tell another inventor that his invention will not work. The US Patent Office says that it won't uh, patent any machine that violates the laws of thermodynamics. But the inventors get around the legal law by obscuring their violation of the physical law. They do th that by clouding things with a lot of complicated machinery. And uh, the office, the patent office, is fooled with tedious regularity. It's a strange thing. So as people grew desperate for a new energy source, inventors responded with every conceivable variation on the over-centered wheel. Reasonable people knew that something was wrong with these machines, but the only way they knew they were doomed was that long trail of failures. And then, at the last minute, a British inventor, Thomas Savory, offered a completely new concept. He built a steam-powered pump in 1698. He alternately let high-pressure steam into two of those big flasks, and that drove water I was supposed to drive water 100 feet up. Then he squirted cold water in to condense the steam that had pushed the water up. That created a vacuum and sucked water up from below. OK? Uh, it seems perfectly reasonable thing. And in fact, he built a demonstration model. And it sort of worked. He managed to lift water maybe. Uh, maybe seven or eight meters, and that was it. Uh, uh, but still, uh, he had shown people that this could be made to work, that steam could be the answer to pumping mines. And sure enough, 14 years after Savory built his crude pump, Thomas Newcomen created a practical steam engine. He too condensed steam to create a vacuum, but he used that suction to pull upon a piston. Down through the 18th century, better and better engines were built, but most were variations on Newcomen's idea. Then, toward the end of the century, James Watt made great improvements. His engines were significantly more efficient, and so steam power plants sprung up all over Great Britain and then all over Europe. But now, a new problem. Did we have enough coal for all these engines? Now we're back to the business of how much coal did we have. At first, Watt's uh, high efficiency engines seemed to be the solution. But then in 1845, an English mathematician, William Stanley Jevons, saw the catch. He wrote a book titled The Coal Question. He said, someday our coal seams may be found emptied to the bottom and swept clean like a coal cellar, our fires and furnaces suddenly extinguished, and cold and darkness left to reign over a depopulated country. People, uh, people uh, thought at first that the efficiency of Watt's engines would reduce coal consumption. 
uh, by their, their new high efficiency. Watts, Watts engines, by the way, were, you know, like right at the beginning, about four times as, as efficient as the old Newcomen engines. Wouldn't this be the solution? By the way, not even Jevons could know that steam engines were already getting close to the thermodynamic limits to its efficiency. I mean, right now we know the steam engines are capped at about, I don't know, 40, 45%. We're not going to get much better than that. Uh, but what Jevons did see was that increased efficiency was not the solution to an energy crisis. And this is one of the things that we really have to th think about, maybe for the panel, uh, we can talk about this later this afternoon. Uh, Watts engines were invented because the old Newcomen engines were inefficient, and it just didn't work. Now, coal consumption was skyrocketing. A few years later, Henry Bessemer invented a new highly energy efficient scheme for smelting steel. Jevons' argument played out once more. Now that it cost less to make steel, we began making everything from steel, plows, toys, storefronts. Energy efficiency had again driven con coal consumption upward even more. We saw Jevons' idea replaying yet again after the Arab oil embargo <coughs> in the 1970s. What happened then? Our response was to create more efficient cars. The result? We Americans soon doubled the number of miles we drove. One person who failed to read Jevons was Karl Marx. He thought that production would become so efficient as to eliminate most work. There are few failures of Marxist theory uh, as dramatic as that one. Industrializ industrialization freed us all right. It freed us to find other kinds of things to work at. So we hurtled toward a new shortage, a shortage of coal. Then technology gave us another last minute rescue. This time it was the realization that we could gain access to another kind of fossil fuel, petroleum. The first oil wells appeared in the latter 19th century and few things have so changed the face of the world. The per capita consumption of oil has since rocketed up to over five barrels per year for each person in the world. Then after the Arab oil embargo in the late 70s, it seemed to level off, but there's a catch. This is per capita. The world consumption kept increasing because the number of capitas, <laughs> the number of heads <laughs> increased, right? Uh, Now, of course, natural gas is being added to the mix, so fossil fuel consumption is rising to the point at which we all see greenhouse gases strangling our planet. It's no great surprise that the CO2 levels are now the highest they've been in human history, or even in Neanderthal history, if you want to go back a little further, we have the record <laughs> back about 400,000 years. Uh, and the world's temperature is rising with it. So it might seem that our ecology and our survival are doomed as we ride the delightful downward roller coaster of energy production and energy consumption. But before we go down the road of doom and gloom, consider something. What I've done is to describe four different major energy crises. I'll summarize them very briefly. Human in ingenuity solved the running out of coal crisis in the 13th century. We found out how to replace wood with coal. Coal led to an increased population in a world that grow, grew dirty and overcrowded. It was an unsustainable world. This time the problem was solved by the intervention of nature. 14th century famine and plague violently reduced the human population across Europe and Asia. The world was not repopulated until cleaner coal use could be developed. By the late 17th century, now we're running out of coal. Then human ingenuity, the invention of the steam engine, let us pump water out of mines and dig further. It saved us at the last moment. Europe 
was facing a coal crisis in the 19th century, like the 13th century crisis, this was not, this was solved by the appearance of a new fuel, namely petroleum. Now we face a crisis much like that of the 14th century. The overabundance of fossil fuel made resources plentiful for a while. That in turn has driven up population, led to hunger, pollution, wars, climate, uh, uh, and uh, as the climate reduces resources, especially along the populous Tropic of Cancer region around the world, that's where it's really catching it right now. So we can chalk up three for human ingenuity and one for natural disaster, okay? And one to be determined. That's the one we're in now. So let's look more closely at these five crises and see what guidance they might provide. Notice that I used the phrase energy shortages in my title. That's because I want to keep our eye on the importance of shortages. At the same time, my crises represent crazy imbalances. They're all caused as we lurch between shortage and overabundance. When things are going well, we get greedy and go too far. We go into problem so solving mode only when things go badly. Shortage provides, uh, proves to be our friend, not our enemy. This symposium is focused on alternative energy sources, but notice something odd about that. An energy shortage would be the perfect spur, the needed kick, the espuela for alternate energy technologies. But this time, the spur is not a shortage. It is instead the danger posed by an abundance of fossil fuels. Another point, consumption correlates almost perfectly with wealth. People who can afford to use energy will use it. The only disparity on this list is a slight one. What happened? Oops. A slight one between Mexico and China. I expect be that's partly because Mexico is a little warmer and leads, needs less heating. And as Mexico, China, and India are becoming more wealthy, they are all burning more fuel. Again, Mexico is a bit of a surprise here. Uh, Mexico's income per person had been increasing at about 50% per decade. I guess you're in some trouble now, as we are in many other countries. Uh, but only around 10% uh, per decade in oil production. Maybe that fact reflects a special sanity here in Mexico. In any case, the previous crises that have uh, been resolved by, uh, the previous uh, crises that have not been resolved by catastrophe have been resolved in one of two ways, by new access to uh, uh, existing resources or by the creation of wholly new resources. Still, some potential solutions aren't uh, new at all. We've just failed to engage them to the extent that we could. Two non-renewable sources like fossil fuel uh, come from within the earth, our nuclear power and geothermal power. Nuclear reactors presently produce about 20% of uh, uh, energy in the United States. They could produce a great deal more, and I think they definitely should. Geothermal energy is available only in certain regions. It's easier to access near tectonic plate boundaries, and so far it's proven uh, to release some greenhouse gases, but much less than fossil fuels. So far, the extent of this resource, however, appears to be limited. Another source that's not really renewable is tidal power, or should we call it renewable? I think we can debate that one. Here I should mention that all energy sources run down, even that of the sun. But tidal, tidal power energy, sapping the, the energy of rotation of Earth, uh, is... Uh, runs down slowly enough that we don't have to fear using it. And by the way, uh, we were talking last night about this, and 
uh, the point was made around the table that when we talk about renewable energy, there's no such thing as renewable. All energy runs down. That's the second law of thermodynamics. But it's a question of time scale, isn't it? The rate at which things run down is what is important. Uh, anyway, another energy source that's not really renewable uh, is uh, uh, tidal power. Well, no, I'm, excuse me. Uh, yeah, the, th the thing I want to say about tidal power uh, is that uh, it has been on our minds for a long time. The tides are slowly consuming kinetic energies of Earth's rotation, and extracting a bit more energy would add very little to slowing us down. But And tidal mills, mills that extracted power from water by raising by, uh, water that was raised by tides, they were a medieval development, and they were used rather extensively in coastal regions. Uh, excuse me, I've got out of sequence here. Yeah, this is an example of a medieval tidal mill. And uh, uh, what you see is there's a containment basin here. It fills up when the tides rise, and then it drains slowly through a mill. Um, but as I was saying, uh, the real problem with tidal power is that it has the potential for meeting only a small fraction of our energy needs. Ninety years ago, the world consumed only about an eighth of today's energy. And at that time, people thought the tidal power would give us much of the energy we wanted. That is far, far from true today. It's a limited resource. And that's the reason uh, that it will be useful to us only if we get smart enough to create a properly uh, integrated energy economy that is diverse. And uh, that's something I think we also, uh, also need to talk about and think about during the panel. Uh, but we're here to talk today about energy sources that are renewed by the sun. And many of these have been around as long as we've harnessed energy. It was humankind's first energy source, and let us hope that we can reclaim it. First, a quick list of ways that we might replace fossil fuel energy with energy uh, that the sun constantly replenishes. Think of various direct solar energy recovery schemes, hydroelectric energy, converting ocean thermal energy, or OTEC. Are any of you aware of that one? Uh, taking energy uh, temperature difference between the Gulf Stream and the cold water below and creating a very low temperature difference steam engine or uh, heat engine. Uh, wind energy, biomass, wave energy recovery. And I'm sure that many of you in your studies can add to this list, what am I forgetting? Uh, I need to point out how long people have been experimenting with these means, how long we've actually been using them. Direct solar energy has been on people's minds for a very long time. And maybe you've heard the legend about Archimedes defeating the Persian fleet by setting it on fire with a solar lens. Is that familiar to you? You know that story? Well, there's a, there's a story of that kind. Uh, uh, but <laughs> was it true? It's clearly a, call, a tall tale, I guess the... Spanish word would be uh, cuento de hadas, uh, a fairy tale. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, the French really did show that they could use solar energy to boil water some 250 years ago. Uh, and the 19th century saw a lot of experimentation with solar collection. A solar-powered steam engine was featured at the 1878 Paris Expedition, for example. And after that, the Swedish-American inventor John Ericsson powered his version of a Stirling hot air engine uh, using a solar collector. Hydroelectric power leapt forward from the water wheel to the turbine in the early 19th century. That's when the French first applied their new mathematical understanding of fluid flow. They saw that with proper blade design, a turbine could collect almost all the energy in falling water and put it to use. They were achieving energy conversion rates and are today 
that are up above 95 percent in a in a water turbine. The problem with hydroelectric power is that its use is close to saturated. So many of the usable streams have been dammed. Washington State has by far the largest hydropower production in the United States, about seven gigawatts, uh, and almost no way to get more. Today, hydropower accounts for most of the state's electricity, but only a fraction of total water use. Wind power, on the other hand, has the potential for ger generating a great deal of energy, and we've come a long way since the first wind power generator was built in 1888. The United States already gets 20, uh, 1 25th of its energy from wind turbines. In my state of Texas, we get 9% of our power from the wind. And again, this is grist for our conversation. Later today, there is some question about the, the true viability of these uh, methods because they have government support. There's questions about the durability of engines and a lot of stuff. Let's talk about that this afternoon. Uh, and uh, these numbers are increasing all over the world. China, by the way, leads everyone with about a third of the, wind, of the world's wind power. I could continue like this, reviewing possible technologies for replacing fossil fuels, or at least creating a new mix of resources, and that I think we need to stress, the idea of a diverse power economy. Uh, but here's the catch. Most of the renewal, renewable energy methods we consider today are old ideas in new clothes, and that is good. But make no mistake, no mistake, look at the crises I've described. First, running out of wood in medieval Europe, solution, discovering a new fuel that nobody had previously realized was a fuel, coal was a surprise. Second, overpopulation and pollution in the 13th century. Disaster was imminent. Famine seemed to be the looming killer, but no, the ecological mess paved the way for something completely unexpected. The plague was a surprise. Third, running out of coal in the late 17th century. Perpetual motion gave people hope for a replacement energy source, but no, the steam engine was the surprise that extended the abundance of coal. Fourth, running out of coal again in the mid-19th century. Extracting oil from below the ground was the surprise that saved us. Fifth, as in the 13th century, we now face overpopulation and pollution. We look to known renewable sources of energy or to nuclear power. Alternatively, we fear death by war, heat, pollution, starvation. You see where I'm going here. We cannot predict the future. We can only create the future. And that's why the University of Guanajuato has called us here today to put our heads together to muster the will and the desire to do something new. So one closing thought. It is a saying attributed to Louis Pasteur. Chance favors only the prepared mind. If our deliverance is to be a surprise, and history suggests that it probably will, we must create our future with prepared minds, minds that expect to be surprised. Many of the renewable sources that we already know holds the key, but in some unexpected form or combination. Maybe some engineer will finally solve the puzzle of providing clean nuclear energy or nuclear fusion. Nobody is saying much about nuclear fusion here, and yet it is the elephant in the room, is it not? The answer is there. The resolution of this crisis can happen to us, like the plague did, or we can make it happen the way we did when we created steam engines. But that means being alert to possibility. You can make it happen. You will make it happen. And so my closing question is, how does it feel in the generation that holds the future of the human race in your hands. Thank you. Gracias por su atención.
it working? Yep. We'll open the floor for questions here. If you guys want to ask something and you are kind of hesitant about your English, I'll just give it in Spanish, so it's okay. Uh, one thing that I want to put you uh, uh, in your mind is that this guy knows it all. So take advantage, you know. Uh, some of the things that he mentioned, uh, people forget about history. I know uh, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure you don't. So, guys, take the chance to ask questions. Right here. We have Sir. Professor Zamora from Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana. Uh, thank you for your very nice words and wisdom. Uh, I enjoyed a lot your lecture. It, it seems to me that more than a technological problem, we have a human attitude problem. Indeed. And uh, it also looks to me that probably the, the solution should come from politics more than engineers. Yes. What uh, do you think about it? Well, I think you're absolutely right. There, there's a huge uh, problem of educating the public, and I think that is our task. I think it's one we should undertake and drive home. I think the Internet is a place where uh, more and more people are being driven in to learn what we know. Uh, and I think that it is our friend in this uh, endeavor. Uh, but no, you're absolutely right. And if you look at history, you will find you will find much of the same thing: resistance to change, uh, the assumption that if I'm not in pain right now, I don't have to worry. That is 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 a terribly terribly important point. And politicians' concern is is with their own pain, which is probably re-election. Yeah. Okay, another question here. Will you identify yourself so everybody gets to know each other? You know, tell us who, who you are. What you are uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Maximiano Gaspara. I'm a stu uh, student, a doctor degree in Politecnico. And I've been working in solar energy and the problems I have found is that uh, solar energy is not steady. In, uh, it means um, sometimes there's a lot of sun, and other times there's so much, the, the weather is cloudy, or there's a lot of pollution. And my question is, how many alternative energies we must develop to completely uh, replaced uh, or petroleum dependence the when you talk about solar energy albedo and all that stuff the uh, when you talk about the unsteadiness you're really talking about direct forms uh, there is also wind energy which is unsteady uh, tidal energy unsteady but distributed and that's one reason that I think we all agree that a distributed renewable economy is the one that will make sense, not uh, a one-size-fits-all. One yeah. You think? That's right. But how many, you mean that there must, we, we must develop three types multiple, of? Multiple, multiple ways of capturing the energy of the sun. And that might even, uh, you know, there are wilder schemes I haven't mentioned, like like putting focused reflectors on the moon and beaming <laughs> micro <laughs> microwaving microwaving energy down you know there 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 are uh, there are more complex and more interesting means for harnessing solar energy than than we've talked about or that were on my list there are, remember surprise surprise thank you you guys any other question for panelists, no questions. Uh, there was they'll get they'll get me at noon. <laughs> I've made notes about your talk. <laughs> be, be, be sure I will. Yeah, uh, last night we were at dinner and we were talking about several issues and uh, actually some of the issues we want to bring them for the panel. So to let you guys also interact with the panel with the questions. 
But uh, there was something that you mentioned there about the unexpected. About which? The unexpected. You unexpected, know, are, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we don't want to get our hopes high, right? We are more than 7,000 million people by now. Yes. So this is unexpected thing. Gosh. I don't quite understand. Well, you know, 7,000 million people. Yes. We need tons of energy that, you know, in the yes. 1300s. Yeah. Wasn't that really? I mean, there were wild animals, they could survive. Yeah. And, but well, all I'm saying is that, that we need to be prepared for surprise. We need to be light of foot. We need to be ready to change direction and see something coming at us from the side road. We need to be ready for something that, that is not already in our mind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really believe that. Uh, before we finish this presentation, let me tell you something about this guy that I didn't mention at the beginning. In ASME, which I guess we are all proud to be members of, is the Society of Mechanical Engineering, uh, people had to put their work for free. We, we are in committees, we are in uh, developing new codes, you know, like that. There are more than 600 codes developed by ASME that have been put into place in industry and in their homes. And this guy right here has taken, like, on his shoulder to keep the history. And I'm going to show you something that you can all access in the internet. So if you guys, if the guys there, please get me into the internet. Can you guys get me into the internet? And um, Professor Lienhar has developed a way to communicate with people through radio. So he started developing this thing about telling people about science and technology in the radio. So by now, he has developed, with some other people by now, more than 3,000 episodes of science and technology. Those episodes are reachable by you. You can get that in the internet. So get to the, uh, go to another web page there, open, open a, a page, and go to www.uh, University of Houston, UH, U, UH, U, U, University of Houston, UH, 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 punto, edu, edu, forward slash, diagonal, it's engines. Engines, lowercase. Engines, engines. Engines. Engines, okay, enter, yeah. So you guys access here, there are two things that I'm sure you're gonna be happy about accessing. Free books. Dr. Lienhar has really made me envious. He has a son who is right now in the other auditorium, yeah, who is gonna be coming in a few minutes here. And uh, he has developed, they have both developed a book that is free, downloadable. You can guys go out and go in and get it. And there are be uh, beautiful things about that book that you know he was telling me about. The introduction of the book was started also with his son when his son was in high school, if I remember right. He did the index. He, he did the index, at least he did the index in high school. So he put his son to work in the index. And, and he invented a new uh, transient response graph that while I he was in high school. A new transient response graph. While he was yeah. in, in high school. Yeah. But so you guys can click it here and then you can download it. There are some questions there. You know your name and why you are. Uh, hey. Sure. Later, later, later. They, they can do it at their own home. Yeah. And uh, and then there is another Enrico. Here is the book. The one you were talking about. It's statistical term. It's for free. Okay. This is for graduate students mainly which most of you are, okay? But the, the, that's the one point. The other point I want to re raise to you is that when you go here, here to Engines trans Transcript, go, go there, you can download all the episodes. All the episodes are there. You go and click in any of them, go and click in any. any. The, the amount of information, you know, we are engineers. You can talk about all kinds of things, engineering, and he has done it for us. 
So I think this will be part of your inheritance to us because you guys can access to this free and the ones that don't handle the English too much, go back. One more. They had already worked on the Spanish episodes. And click on the Spanish episode. And uh, they are translated already, the Spanish. And also there is an audio. You can, you can download also the audio so you can listen to it if you want to. Not me. <laughs> Américo Vespucio, Guerra contra las Enfermedades, que nos habló de eso. So all of these guys, you can access that for free. All right? That just tells you who, you, who he is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, vamos a tomar un ligero break en lo que hacemos los cambios que el doctor Liengar, su hijo. Ah, tenemos una que mi hijo se le entregue. Please uh, give that to him on behalf of the ASME students. On behalf of the ASME students, we give to you this diploma. Diploma? Hey, I'm an honorary graduate. <laughs> Gracias. Oh, you are Adam. Glad to meet you. Glad to meet you. Let's have a break and then I really like your speech.